Okay, well, uh, we're going to get started. So again, welcome. So my name is Christine. This is Orby. We are both with uh, MyNet, and we're talking about Googling for good evidence today. So oops, that didn't work. There we go. All right. So um, the goal of this session is to talk about a couple of things. So first, we're going to talk a little bit about MyNet for anybody who is not really familiar with it. We're going to talk about how Google works and ranks the results. We're going to de demonstrate some techniques that you can use to make your Googling a little better. And we're going to talk a bit about critically appraising uh, what you find through Google, which is uh, very important these days. So uh, we have a poll to get going. And we were just wondering whether or not anybody has actually attended one of our Google sessions before. So we'll give you a, a few minutes, and uh, if you want to answer, that would be great, and then we can we can get on with the show. So we're still waiting on a few more people to vote. We'll give you about 20 more seconds. Sure. Okay. So it seems like, oh, good. We might have like one more person. Um, we'll close the poll. It seems like most of you have not attended our session before. Welcome. And, uh, and a couple of you have attended last year's webinar. So this year it's uh, very similar, but with some new stuff and some new examples and Christine, new people. <laughs> is this, this is your second webinar with us, right? Yes. Right. Okay, so welcome back and welcome. Okay, so um, we'll start off talking a little bit about MyNet. Um, and MyNet is a, a fantastic acronym. It's for the Manitoba's <laughs> Health Information and Knowledge Network. And basically, we're, we're a library service. Um, and we run out of the University of Manitoba's Health Sciences Libraries. And uh, folks who work for Manitoba Health, seniors and active living, fee-for-service physicians, and staff at participating regional health authorities are all eligible to use the service for free, which is awesome. Um, the team is made up of four of us, so Orby and myself, of course, but we've also got uh, Gail and Cheryl. And so we keep the wheels on the bus. Right? We keep things going. <laughs> um, and one of the kind of I guess basic things to do with any library is a library card. Um, if you don't have a MyNet library card, we suggest you get one. Um, as I said, the service is uh, free to eligible uh, folks, and that card allows you to borrow books from the University of Manitoba library system, um, which is pretty handy. Uh, if you are interested in getting a card, we've got a URL up there on the screen. Um, you can also send an email to our general email address or give us a call too and then we can make things happen. In terms of the services, um, there are a, a few core services that we, we carry out. Um, literature searches is a big one, so if you are interested in a particular topic, um, you can either you know, send us an email, fill out our online form, or even give us a call and um, we can do a search uh, for you on your behalf. Uh, we do document delivery, so if there's particular items that you're interested in, um, whether it's a book from the uh, university library or if it's articles, um, we can uh, get those to you as well. We've also got a current awareness service, um, and if anybody is not really familiar with what that entails, um, basically you pick a, a particular journal or set of journals, um, or if there's a topic, we can customize uh, something and at regular interval intervals, you'll get uh, emails with what's new in that area, what's recently been published in the literature. Um, so then you can go ahead and order it through document delivery if you want to. <laughs> okay. And last but not least, we have um, training sessions um, like this one. So um, we have kind of general orientation to MyNet. Uh, there's a separate session that we, we did just um, the other month about critical appraisal. Um, obviously, there's the Googling for evidence, and I think the next one coming up is about healthcare apps. Yes. So. 
And so we have a series that we um, that we uh, provide to everyone. But if ever you and your team or some of your colleagues are getting together and you'd like us to come and do a session, or if you've got something really specific or even broad, specific, broad, whatever, we're happy to create uh, to tailor make those um, sessions as well for you and your team. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, that's kind of the overall gist. As I mentioned, um, the library cards will get you access to things, but you do need to go through us as, as kind of, you know, the middlemen, um, because direct access is not available, generally speaking, uh, for the university um, collection. Although, because everyone wears multiple hats these days, if you happen to be a NIL appointee or you're a student, you have, you have a student card, um, you automatically get access to the university collection um, that you can go about yourself, right? Yeah. Um, but even if you do, if you want us to do a search, we'll still do it for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, the only exception to that is uh, up to date. So up to date is an uh, online resource. It's a point of care tool, um, and all MyNet um, clients can access it. So again, Manitoba Health folks, uh, staff at the participating, I can't talk, sorry, participating <laughs> uh, regional health authorities, um, fee for service physicians, and I guess cancer care as well. Is that? Yep, cancer, cancer care. Yep, cancer care as well. Look at that. Um, and so um, in order to get access to that, you would need to have that library card and you would log in using that information. So that's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to switch it over to Orby here. Okay, so I'll also mention um, at this time that we've got a slide deck of everything that we're covering in today's session. And at the end of the session, we'll be sending um, all the slides out to you. So you don't, if you miss something or if you're practicing along with us as you go um, and you think, oh gosh, what was that again? Don't worry, we'll be sending those to you. Um, and so we thought before we actually start Googling, Googling, we'll talk for just a second about how Google actually works. And a little bit, it's a mystery. Uh, we certainly don't know. But what we understand is that there's essentially these, as you can sort of see in this infographic, um, we think about it like as spiders. And so Google is always going out into the internet and finding uh, different things. So finding instances where a word is used or a phrase or all this kind of thing. And it goes out and it sort of collects all of that information and that is then what it uses to um, provide its search results so it's always changing as new information is coming as people are using different information differently uh, so your results from one day to the next will be changing partly because information changes and updates um, but also just because of the nature of how Google works so how those spiders actually go out and come back and um, rejig that algorithm. Uh, that is the big proprietary Google. That's how they make their money. They're That's not how they make us. their money. They don't tell <laughs> us. We just know the um, in a nutshell. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take you over to this screen and I'm going to just make sure it's displaying okay and hopefully it's big enough here. Um, we also uh, forgot to mention that if ever you've got a question, uh, you can use the chat box and just pop us a message um, or, or if you've got a cool example as well as, um, you know, something that you'd love to share. I know it's always hard to, we're always trying to think about ways to better engage um, the uh, 22 of you who are viewing with us today. Uh, and it's a little bit hard. It's not like when we're in the classroom, but please do if you've got a cool example or even not a cool example or a question, pop it in the chat box. So first thing is we will start with a Google search. So I've got Google set, um, I'm at google.ca and CA is the extension that theoretically will get you more Canadian results, although uh, probably .com will get you similar results. Yeah. Uh, and um, so, so I can enter here. I also have in my browser, I've got Google set as my default search engine. Uh, that's something that you can set in your internet browser. I think sometimes the default is like for Bing, which 
I feel is not actually for real and it's more like for play uh, because it has such bizarre results. So if you don't have Google as your search, you can change that uh, if you want to. Um, so I can just do a, uh, a search here in Google. And the first thing that I'm going to do is just a really quick scan of the results. So on um, so what it's doing here, I've asked about tattoos and it first shows me a map and then it shows me some places where I could get a tattoo. Now I've got top stories. These are kind of news type items. And then as I scroll down, um, then I can just quickly look. So I've got Wikipedia. I've got a place where I can get tattoos. So most of this is about places in Winnipeg that I can get tattoos. If I come back up to the top and I look on the right hand side, there's a description about uh, tattoos that is pulled from Wikipedia. Um, and sometimes this will be where the ads are. So if I, um, sometimes then our first results will be ads. So I'll look, I'll search now for Canadian Tire because they always, they pay Google so that they're the top search result when you search Canadian Tire. And you, I, can, I know this because at the top here, uh, there's a little square and it says that it's an ad. So this is something that, just to watch out for, sometimes it's helpful, like I'm searching for Canadian Tire, I want actually Canadian Tire, it's fine to click on the ad. Other times, um, you might wanna be more wary of when the ads are at the top of your screen. So that's just a, a quick kind of um, overview as we quickly screen through. Ads are always at the top. Sometimes they're at the sides. And you can also look and see what the source of the results are. So if I all again search on tattoo, and this time I look about safety, I have now a little description from the FDA. I've got some common questions people ask, but as I scroll down, I can look at the green line here where it's telling me where this comes from. So one is WebMD, one is the FDA, one is Consumer Reports, then is CBC. So depending on what I'm looking for or why I'm looking for it, sometimes I will avoid this sort of title of, of what's going on here and I'll just look at what the sources are or sometimes not again depending what you are now again you may have noticed I think I spoiled it when I searched on tattoo it searched on Winnipeg and uh, this is great so I know that a bunch of you are joining us from throughout the province uh, give your Google a little test and you search tattoo too you probably uh, will get very different results than what we do here because we're in Winnipeg so Google, uh, being the good, uh, creepy web company that it is, um, you know, pros and cons of all of these things, uh, it knows that I am here in Winnipeg right now. And so it has tailored my results to results in Winnipeg. If I wanted to know about um, tattoo places in Calgary, I'd need to tell it, Google, tell me about tattoo places in Calgary. And so now I've got an ad. And then I scroll down and then here it's Google is showing me a map of Calgary and now it's showing me um, some different tattoo parlors in in Calgary. So just be aware that sometimes because sometimes you might be like, gosh, why is it always giving me these results? Uh, or if you're, you know, if you're thinking like, why isn't it showing me these other results that I know are out there? Sometimes you have to tell it Google, I don't just want to know about the ones that are here near me. I want to know about ones in Canada or ones in the Maritimes or whatever you want to look for. Yeah. Um, just to, to jump in, yeah. this is, I mean, we're looking about tattoos, but if you're looking for, say, guidelines and things like that, that's going to have an impact on what you find too, right? Yeah, and that's a great point too. Um, throughout our session today, we'll be giving you um, sort of tips about things like just how to find movie times faster, <laughs> uh, you know, which has nothing to do with your job. Um, or how to find clinical practice guidelines faster and easier. And the same rules apply for things that make you a better Google searcher in sort of regular life and versus in your in your work life. So uh, uh, 
that's a great that's a great point um, Google also remembers what you searched before so I don't know if you've ever done this if you if you Google a lot at work and then you go home and you're trying to look up a few things or finish up something and you think like gosh like I I am not as smart tonight as I was earlier today what the heck is going on what happens is your Google actually isn't as smart at home when you're on a different computer and it doesn't know that it's you um, and uh, and we'll talk about how to make it either be more like your work or less like your work uh, a little bit later um, but it it, Google remembers that you like certain things and don't like certain things. So it might know that, uh, like here at work, we we're, we search on if we let's say use the consumer resources out of the Mayo Clinic. Uh, if we've clicked on those a number of times, they're great consumer resources. Uh, it Google will tend to float those more to the top, and will float other things down the more we click on them. And I just want to make sure I got all of those. So just some really quick um, things that sometimes can save you tons of time. Google is not case sensitive. So if I type in FASD, which is an acronym for fetal alcohol um, spectrum disorder, it, it does, I get the same results as if I type it in in CAPS. So that is really helpful. You can be a bit lazier on your computer. Um, and another really helpful one is quotations. And if you were in the classroom, I would make you, maybe I should have done a poll of this, I would have made you raise your hand and say, who knew, knows about quotations? This is really helpful. If you're looking for a phrase, such as long-term care, and you're only interested in long-term care as those three words appear in that order together, uh, then put them in quotation marks. And it will give you results that only include long-term care as a phrase. And um, so if I just did long-term care, the first few results will probably be the same. Yeah, but then as we go down, it'll they'll be a bit different. So sometimes if you're searching for a phrase or if you found, you know, sometimes you've printed something out and you're like, I just, where the heck did I get this from? You can take a, like a string of that sentence and put it in quotations and pop it into Google and Google will really quickly find it for you again. So that's a really helpful, um, something that's really helpful. You also... Uh, the order that you use, that you put your words, it matters. So earlier today, I was looking for places that um, were would um, be an exam. If you needed to write an exam and you needed an invigilator and you wanted to know, does the University of Manitoba do exam invigilation? Invigilation. Of course, I chose a word that is hard to spell, invigilation. Um, and so I said, I used U Manitoba. I could have put in quotations, University of Manitoba. U Manitoba is just a bit quicker. It's in all the university's um, web addresses, so it should pick it up. Um, and if I found that there was too much about the university at the front and it axed out in Vigilator, then I would change the order. So that's, not, what was I doing earlier? And, oh, I know. Um, if I do uh, Rady Faculty of Health Sciences, I think this is it. There we go. Um, of course, I am smarter at searching this because I've been searching it already today. Sometimes, if you then, if you're not finding those results and you're saying, Google, I really need to know about the invigilation aspect and not so much about the University of Manitoba, if I put invigilation at the front, that will really be helpful. Uh, and so that's just an easy um, tip if you, you know, if you're searching for a bunch of different things and you're like, gosh, it's just not getting me the results I want. And take the most important word that you're searching for and pop it to the start. That can be really helpful. So uh, the other thing is that you don't need to ask Google questions. So you'll notice that in this search box, I just said invigilation, U Manitoba and Rady Faculty of Health Sciences exam. I didn't say like, hey Google, does the University of Manitoba uh, provide exam invigilation services? Question mark. 
You don't need to write it like that. You can write it more directly um, so that Google will pick up those key words for you. Uh, the other thing is, particularly when we're looking for health information, depending on what you're looking for, you might want to use medical terms versus layperson terms. So a good example is heart attack. Um, if I was looking for resources to provide to patients, um, then I might search on heart attack and you'll see it's the Heart and Stroke Foundation. We've got warning signs. We've got a bunch of national um, organizations that focus on, on heart attacks and heart safety. And then we have Wikipedia. But if I am looking for some resources for uh, a cardiologist, these are going to be kind of basic. Cardiologists already know about these associations. I am going to search instead on myocardial infarction, and we'll see that the results are different. So um, often Google will pr provide us a definition, um, some common questions, and now we're into things from, um, they're still pretty, pretty basic, Healthline, WebMD, e-medicine, that kind of thing. Um, but you can see that these are very different, these are very different results. So yeah. I, know, oh, I noticed that the Merck manual was at the bottom. The Merck manual, yeah, is down here. That's a really great resource for clinicians. Um, so that's just a good, a good tip. Maybe sometimes too, you might need to use the more lay version. Sometimes you'll want the more uh, clinical version. So just keep in mind um, that there are different results based on even, you know, based on synonyms. Um, that being said, Google uh, does do a lot of interpretation for you. So if I search on the word diet, Google automatically is going to search on the extensions of the word diet. So diet, diets, dieting, uh, all those things. It's providing here, the word you can just see, this is a diet, diet. As we go through, um, it'll get a little bit more broad. And so you don't need to worry about like sometimes in our more sophisticated databases, you need to tell it Google search diet and or dieting or diets, et cetera. Uh, Google, Google's pretty good about picking up all of those um, variations. And the same with spelling. Uh, you can spell words wrong. You can spell words the Canadian way. Uh, Google, for the most part, is going to pick it up. And so, of course, I... Um, I'll spell anesthesia the, uh, the UK way. Uh, Google tells me in this case, it's showing me the results for anesthesia the American way. Um, and you can see that it provides, oh yeah, so it's got, it's providing the, the American ways. Um, sometimes, but if you wanna say, no Google, I really don't want the American way, I really wanna search the, um, the UK way, then all, oh my, okay, dental anesthesia, here we go in the 1940s. Um, then it will give me these different results. So um, uh, that's an interesting, I don't remember it doing that before. And that's one of those prime examples of Google is always changing. It is, it's a fact. <laughs> and, and they don't give you a heads up either. You just kind of have to discover these things. Uh, and one other thing, Google um, automatically puts, uh, assumes that you want to do and between all the words. So when I was looking for exam in vigilator in, at the University of Manitoba, Google assumes that I am doing exam, uh, that I want results that have the, those, all three of those words together. Um, you can't, that's, that's how the Google search box works. It's pretty basic and straightforward. Again, it's a little bit different than how other more sophisticated um, databases uh, operate. So mo now we'll talk about punctuation. Uh, so most punctuation is ignored. Question marks, exclamation marks, commas, periods. You can just be super lazy about all of those. Uh, but it does understand a few things, such as if there's a hyphen, in words, it will, you can use that. Uh, Google understands, you know, in brother-in-law that that's a common thing. And it also will understand, um, like if you were looking for information about C++, which is a computer programming information, uh, computer programming language, 
or if you were talking in musical terms, if we're looking for G sharp chords, and you can see too, I failed to mention, Google often prompts you for things. So sometimes if you're not sure how to spell a word or you start to type it, Google's gonna prompt you. Um, and it's also gonna prompt you for um, different things that you would wanna know about G sharp chords. So that's helpful. Um, and those were the ones, do you pop in there or do I have a little bit more? I have a little bit more. Okay. Um, now another neat thing, and sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't work great, but sometimes it's just one of those little tips that you might, you know, in six months go like, oh gosh, this is the perfect opportunity to try that, try what they were telling us about. Um, and this is for um, uh, uh, times when the same word means two very, very different things. So uh, nursing is both the practice uh, that nurses do and also the act of breastfeeding babies. So if I'm looking for something about nursing, um, but I don't want to know about breastfeeding, I can use the minus sign uh, for, for breastfeeding. And so I got an ad at the top, but then I come into nursing programs, um, a bunch of different nursing programs and not breastfeeding. It's interesting that the ad didn't follow that. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know what that's about. And again, that's I've had somewhat inconsistent results using this minus sign. Mm -hmm. So it might just be one of those one of those things, but it is well, it shows you that ads trump all. Yes. <laughs> it's all about the money. All about the money. Um so that's a helpful one. Another helpful one is, and again, I was just using this today, uh, is if you want to search for something, oh, I know, I was trying to find something on Statistics Canada, and I don't know if you have the same experience. It's like, it's very hard to search a bunch of government websites, um, or sometimes if a, if a site doesn't have a very sophisticated or um, adequate search engine on it, and you just want to know, uh, you know, um, so uh, I'm going to use um, CIHI actually because uh, that's a bit easier to type. So if I want to say, I want to know what is on the um, Canadian Institute for Health Information site about mental health, or actually, I want to know about tattoos. Uh, I want to know what they're talking about tattoos. And so I'll have to put, actually, I'll just change it. So my results now will only be, because they don't have a lot about tattoos. They don't have a lot about tattoos, so that is really interesting. And uh, you can see Google is saying, like, oh, you only got one result. Uh, we can make this more broad. If I wanted to do that, I could. But otherwise, um, sometimes if you're if you're interested in scanning across different provinces or doing that bigger environmental scan, this is a really helpful thing. Um, if you're like, I know that StatsCan or that CIHI has something about tattoos, then um, this can be, uh, you can see here, it just uh, needed to do a bit of a different um, tattooing. There's a few more there. So site, semicolon, sometimes really helpful uh, to get around other people's websites. And similarly for if you're ever searching for a certain file type. So if I was looking for, for some reason, if I wanted a PowerPoint about tattoo safety, I can search for file type PPT. And you'll see here that Google tells me in my results, that's what these little square brackets mean, that uh, there, people have shared there are different presentations about tattoos and um, the uh, their PowerPoint presentations about tattoo safety. So that you can use it for Word docs or Excel files yes. or PDFs. Um, and that might be like maybe, again, maybe you have it sitting in front of you and you just want to try to refine it. Maybe you're looking for something that you want to give to somebody else. Maybe you know that um, the government, you know, um, shares things in PDF form and you're looking for that version. It could be any number of reasons that you want to do that. I'll also mention um, that 
a bunch of these. These are a whole bunch of tips and tricks. And don't feel like you're an incompetent searcher or you're missing out or you're not um, you're not doing it the right way if you're not using all of these. Some, like I say, sometimes I, I happen to be using these this morning. Other times, a couple weeks will go by and I won't use very many of these strategies mm -hmm. at all. And that is just part of the normal course. We just want to make you aware because sometimes it can be it can save you so much time to know some of these tricks. Okay. Uh, I am um, going to just very quickly mention that there is also a Google Advanced Search. They have it uh, a little bit hidden, like I can only ever find it if I Google it. And this would be, you can see here that they give you all these different options. You could search for all of these words or this exact phrase. You can limit by language or re region, things when it was last updated. This is getting quite sophisticated. Um, do you use it ever? Not usually. I don't usually no. use it either. Uh, but some people find it sometimes to be really helpful. And I think for us, if we were needing to do levels of searching um, with this kind of precision, we probably would use the subscription databases that the University of Manitoba pays for. But we know that many of you don't have access to those. And if you needed something right away, um, this is just, again, a helpful tool to know about. Okay, now Christine is going to show you okay. some cool stuff. I get the fun part. You get the fun part. So I'm just going to go back to the main main Google page here, um, and I wanted to tell you about quick answers. And and so these are like the short and snappy things. Um, if you have uh, Siri, or if, if you've got like an Android phone, and you and you, you have that function, go, hey Google, what's the weather in Winnipeg? It's the same kind of function there. Um, and so. For these ones, you would not spend hours combing through the results. Basically, if, if the answer doesn't come up right away, then either it doesn't have it or you might try a different yeah. way to phrase it, right? Um, so I used the, the example of weather. So if you were to type weather, if you're going to a conference in, I don't know, Halifax, who wouldn't want to go I thought to you were going to say Hawaii, but OK. We'll go in Halifax. Halifax is so much better than Hawaii. <laughs> Um, it'll tell you what the current weather is, what the forecast is. Apparently there's a, a heat warning, so that's good to know. Uh, you would know what to pack. Um, the other other ones that I tend to use, we kind of alluded to the movies earlier. Um, so if I want to know what's playing, just the link, right? No, I did not. I have an extra. Oh. One. Spelling, spelling does. I, I think don't. Google would have known though, but. Probably, but um, yeah, just just because I, I fixed it. And so, and so you can see we've got um, the, the lovely posters here, so you know, see what catches our eye. Uh, if if I haven't seen, oh, Rascal Re Rebel Rabbit. <laughs> I don't know what that, oh, it's Peter Rabbit. Um, so I can kind of have a, a quick glance, see what's out there. Um, Ooh, Jurassic World, you know, I want that one. If you click on it, then you'll get the different theaters and the show times and everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I do use the movies quite a lot, but the thing I use, I think, Google for the most is for definitions. Um, because I, I find, like, I when I'm, I'm doing stuff for people, uh, the topics are very varied, right? And I don't necessarily have a lot of expertise in that area being... A librarian and not like a, a clinician. Um, so if I need to know, define scleral, it'll tell me what it means, right? So sometimes um, you get that box, like for example, when Orvi looked for myocardial infarction, it had that box with the definition in it. Um, so if that's kind of in their system, that'll come up. Uh, otherwise, you'll be directed to uh, websites that can potentially help. So we've got Wikipedia. Um, there's some some kind of uh, site about contact lenses, um, some videos and stuff like that. But I can I can see that it is the white part of your eye, right? So so that's very handy. Okay. You can also do other things like um, conversions. So um, I have some cookbooks that um, are like from Australia. And fancy. <laughs> oh, I know. 
um, and, and, and like the UK and stuff also. And so sometimes they'll use those different measurements. Um, they always seem to go by weight. And like, I don't know like how many milliliters is in, I don't know, 500 grams or whatever. Um, but usually, um, yeah, it's good for when you're in the kitchen and, and I'm standing there with my measuring cups and I'm like, I need to know, I don't know about weight. Yeah. Oh, I probably shouldn't tell Chris. Christine's a bit of, is a better, better in the kitchen than I am. But yeah, if you need to, if you have a certain kind of measuring cup and you need to convert it, yeah. Christine's a bit to show you how. Yeah. So um, if you want to say uh, pounds to kilograms, um, up comes this nifty little box. Right, so you can say for each pound how many kilograms, and you can change this. It's like, well, I have 5.5 pounds. That's roughly two and a half kilograms. Right? Um, and you can change what you're looking for, right? So um, you can look at temperature, uh, pressure. Ooh, a plane angle. Look at that. Uh, fuel economy. <laughs> they've got all kinds of interesting things there. Um, so that's that's kind of handy. Um, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip skip over a couple of things that we have in, in that you'll see in the handout, um, and just go straight to translate. So translate is interesting. Um, sometimes uh, if you come across something, it's in like I don't know Polish or German or um, Swahili or whatever. Uh, you need to to, to know what it says. Um, you have two routes you can go. You can go into the search box here and just type in translate, and it, a similar kind of box pop, uh, pops up where, um, so for the language, let's say it's, uh, I know, I, I'm only going to pick this one because I know it works and it's not actually just the same word. Uh, <laughs> in Polish, uh, diabetes, what the, oh, diabetes, hello. That's translate from English to Polish. I have done this before, I swear. <laughs> There we go. So you can see what the translation is. Um, alternatively, you can do large bits of text. So if you had like a paragraph or something, um, and if you go to translate.google.com, so translate. Oh, and did I not see Miss Bessie? Oh, that .com. that would be important. Okay. Right, so if you had, like I said, you had a paragraph or, or something a little more substantial than a single word, you can copy and paste it into the box. You could say, this is in English and I want to know what it is in, you know, whatever language that's in the list. I mean, it doesn't have every single language that's out there, but it, it has quite a few, so it can be quite helpful. Yeah, and it's, um, it, it's, it's often good enough that sometimes we'll come across, you know, a, a research article that's written in, you know, in, in German and we need to just like get a sense of what it's talking about or if it mentions a certain element um, it's good enough for that but you know if you need to actually uh, respond to someone in a different language mm, it, it's not it's maybe, gonna give you that not. sort of funny translation yeah. um, I also know that a number of clinicians use this uh, if they are with a patient and the patient only speaks a, you know German and they don't speak English and they're having trouble just connecting mm -hmm. before sometimes um, Google can just get you through uh, that initial conversation until a translator can come or until somebody else um, can come who speaks that language uh, this can be helpful to have uh, to have available That's or it can just like when your friends on Facebook post in a different language and Facebook doesn't translate it for you you can pop it in here and then respond to them in English right so there you go. So that's 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 something that can be handy sometimes. Um, so um, just real quick before I hand things back over to Orby, we, we talked a little bit about um, Google remembering what you do and, and everything like that. Part of that is to do with uh, cookies that are in your browser, but also if you have a Google account um, that kind of takes it up a notch, right? Because if you sign into Google, it's like it knows it's you, right? So it doesn't matter where you are, it'll it'll collect data that way. Um, and as we said, there's, there's, there's pros and cons, right? Like if, if I, if I want it to focus in on say the tattooed parlors in Winnipeg, great, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but sometimes it, 
if you're trying to find out what's out there just generally in the world, it can kind of skew your results and you might not get the full picture. Um, but um, that is kind of a segue into the next thing that Orphe is going to talk about, which is alerts. Yeah, well, I, I just had one more thing to mention, and that's, you know, sometimes, like I said, about your Google at work is smarter than your Google at home. Um, if you want your Google at home to be as smart as your Google at work, you can sign into Google in both places, mm -hmm. and then it will better be able to know that, yes, in fact, it is you. And alternatively, if you don't want it to know, that you're the same person, right? Especially like sometimes my husband will, if I'm at working at home and he'll come across and, and be like, what are you searching? You know, if I'm searching on pregnancy or different illicit drug use or all these kinds of things. And I'll be like, no, for real, this is for work. Um, so sometimes you don't want your Google to be the same um, at home or at work. So just always kind of, you know, it's a good thing. Sometimes if I don't want Google to remember with what I'm searching, uh, or if I want just a clean slate of results, I'll use a different browser, um, which, you know, which where I'm not logged in to kind of fool it. Uh, there's also the incognito browser. Yeah, so if you, I always forget about that. We should add that we should. to our session. Um, so when you have the, uh, the icon at the bottom of your screen in that ribbon, if you right click, you can have the option to open in a new window, open up a new here? tab. Oh, I guess it depends on whether okay. you're a Mac or a PC. Oh, okay. Um, but um, it's usually along the bottom. So like you've got Firefox open right now. Yeah. Um, oh, so go here. Yeah. So if you have Google Chrome, which is a, the Google um, yeah. search engine, you can have an incognito window. I, I guess I should have mentioned that it, that it, that's for Chrome. I don't know about Mozilla if that's okay. a, a, an option there. And you know what? This is a great uh, on the fly thing. We will incorporate the incognito sort of instructions into our slide deck. And when we share that, then uh, we'll have some more options. Um, I know particularly too, it's helpful for us here because sometimes um, if we're searching for full text things, I'll send links to people and be like, oh, it's freely available. Here you go. And you will write back to me and say, Orby, I can't get it. It takes me to a login. And I'm like, oh, I just, it's, um, you know, that resource is just recognizing that I'm at the university and that I'm, um, that I'm allowed to have access to that. Right. So I'll use that kind of function um, to say, like, pretend like I'm not at the university. Pretend I'm just a normal, just out just, in the world. Just out in the world. Okay. Um, similarly, if you okay, oh, I'm gonna close. What did I do here? Okay. Okay. Great. Similarly, oh my gosh, we are just blowing through our time. Um, there's also something called a Google Alert. So if you want to get alerted to uh, to different things on a regular basis, you can set up these alerts. So you can see that I, these are my personal alerts. I want to know if people are writing about me. Uh, and I want to know about some patient safety stuff. I want to know about the University of Manitoba Faculty Association. Um, and so every, so I've got these set up and you can customize them. Um, and it's just a nice feature uh, that you can give a try. It's got some alert suggestions. So some people use this for news or for music. You know, if you wanted to really keep up on what Taylor Swift is up to, and you can do that. Um, but I know that some, like in government, they use uh, their communications teams will use this to help scan for like, are we in the news today? Who's talking about us? Uh, and the same for different different people or different headlines, that kind of thing. It can be really it can be really helpful as far as like a, a image perspective mm -hmm. um, or just like I want to know what the new thing about tattoo safety yeah, so is. Yeah, I just want to keep up on things. Yeah. So that is uh, alerts really quickly. And um, another Google feature is Google Scholar. And again, should have made it a poll. Who has ever heard of Google Scholar? And this is um, sort of a subset of Google that is um, sending those spiders into the academic literature or into things that look like journal articles. So if we look at tattoos here, and I'm always spelling it tattoos, you can see if you'll, you'll remember that these results are very different. So we can see that these have longer titles 
that they then in the second line, instead of showing us a web address, they're showing us titles and then the journal that they're published in in the year. And then this little segment here is about the abstract and then it gives us some information that this article has been cited 514 times. I can find related articles, I can find different versions, it comes from Web of Science. Um, so this is really, you know, uh, this is can be a really great way to find scholarly literature. You can do some limits um, and some of these this is uh, sometimes if you click into this, it'll just give you the title and the abstract and then it'll say, hey, if you want to read the whole article, you can pay us $85 and we will happily give that to you. But don't do that. Don't do that ever. Send us the citation and we will send you that full text article at no cost to you. So if you take away one thing from today's session, that is it. Don't pay for things. Uh, don't pay for your full text articles. Message us and we will send you the full text. Uh, of that instead. Absolutely. So uh, you can also set up your alerts here in Google Scholar. So if you did want to know about tattoo safety and you wanted to know what the um, scholarly literature was talking about, we can probably we can set up a more sophisticated alert for you through our current awareness. Um, but sometimes you might just want to set up your own Google alert on, on whatever. Uh, and you can see here then it's just down here I can click on this create alert and then um, it will send me results. And I can choose, I can have daily or weekly or monthly or sporadically, uh, and that can be a nice feature as well. So, okay. So um, as, as Orgy mentioned, there's a lot of really, really nifty material out there, right? Um, that Google will find for you. Google will find it for you. Um, but we also have to kind of, be conscious that not everything uh, is of great quality out on the internet. Um, really? I know it's a shock. <laughs> um, oh, so I, oh, actually, I gotta get back to our slides here real quick. Um, so we're gonna talk real quick about critical evaluation here. Oh, I critical can, appraisal. Um, I'm actually, gonna move it over here. Oh, that works too. And. Go. All right. Well, that <laughs> we're trying to change screens, and it's, it it should be okay. This is what they're saying. Is that what they're saying? Oh or, no, I don't think not. so. You're right. Sorry about that. Bear with us here. There we go. Okay. So, um, as just a, a, a super um, kind of quick and easy thing to to think about in the back of your mind when you're looking at your results, um, there's something called the craft test. Um, to help you weed out the crap, I guess. That's where that comes from. Um, but it's it's an acronym, really. So we're talking about currency, reliability, authority, and either purpose or point of view, right? So you want to ask yourself things like, how recent is this information? Um, is this something that is current enough for what you need? So if, if we're talking about, um, you know, something to do with... Um, what was that example we had the other the other session? It was to do with um, the internet, and it, it was something about how how consumers, like healthcare consumers, look for things on the internet. Um, something from like ten years ago is not necessarily going to be uh, the same as now because things have changed, right? Um, whereas something that's a little more stable, maybe maybe something that's older is okay, right? You have to kind of figure that out for yourself. Uh, you also want to see whether things have been updated regularly. Um, if there's a date on that website and it's from like 2001, uh, maybe they're not maintaining it so much. Um, you might want to go to something that's a little more current, right? And and by the same token, if the links don't work, people are not paying attention. They're not maintaining the site. Okay. Uh, in terms of reliability, you want to ask yourself, is this something that is um, supported by evidence, like can you double check where this information is coming from? Do they have sources that they've cited? Um, is this just someone's opinion, right? Is this something that is, is a balanced argument or is this just kind of a one-sided blast in one direction, right? Um, likewise, authority. So who who's putting this stuff up, right? Is it Christine's Diabetes website 
<laughs> or is this the you know the diabetes care um, official journal website right um, the journal website might be with more authoritative than Christine's diabetes website just saying um, and likewise again even if it is something that is from a publisher or a sponsor is there a vested interest in there you know if this if this is something that um, maybe there's kind of an incentive for whoever put it up there to have you think one thing one way or another maybe you want to think about that right yeah and an example um we're always talking about big pharma mm -hmm. so maybe when in your diabetes results you come across um you know some great information but then you notice oh this is all published by a pharmaceutical company yeah. and they want you to buy their test strips and their glucose meter and those different diabetes supplies Yes. Um, so you just want to be always assessing. Yeah, where's it coming from, right? Um, and I mean, that kind of ties in well with, with the P in crap, so purpose or point of view. Um, what's, what's the deal? Like, why is this up there? Is this something that is available um, to try and steer people in a certain direction? Um, I, I'm thinking like the anti-vax people, you know, I don't know where you sit on that one, <laughs> but it's it's very much they have they have their own particular agenda that they're that they're putting out there, right? It's not nece not necessarily uh, balanced, right? It's biased, um, and, and and bias can take all kinds of forms, right? It can be um, like as already said, you know, the, the the business angle. It can just be uh, personal bias. It could be political. All kinds of all kinds of things like that. Okay. Um, so really, you just kind of want to take a step back um, and say, is this the right level of information for your needs? Um, maybe you want to look at a bunch of different sources just to make sure that um, the one that you, you came across first is the one, is, is a good one to use. Um, and we've got a note here at the bottom about spelling, grammar, and, and typos. Um, I mean, mistakes happen, but if if it's rampant then quality control is 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 not necessarily there right so if that's not taken care of what else isn't right. or yeah or was it written by someone uh you know sometimes if you're like this this sentence doesn't totally make sense and it might have been like auto created right by the automated the box. yeah box or that kind of thing yeah and sometimes too um you know these I love the crap test so much because it's easy to remember that there's four elements of it that you should be thinking through those four things. Uh, there's lots of other great resources that you can use it when you're appraising things. Um, and sometimes it's okay, like sometimes it's totally fine to be looking at the information that drug companies are presenting you on different types of glucose meters if you're looking for information about different types of glucose meters. Uh, you know, and you're not happy with one and you want to switch to another or you want to know for your patients um, what they're experiencing, what kind of... Uh, Things are coming into their news feeds, um, you know, so sometimes information from somebody trying to sell you something is good if that's what you're looking for. If you're shopping. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It, it all depends on the circumstance. Yeah. Okay, we are, uh, we've got a little bit, and we're going to do our second and final poll, and we want to know if you have ever heard of predatory publishing or a predatory publisher. So we'll give you a second here. And we're glad everyone is still with us. This is great. Okay. And almost everyone will give you one last second here. Okay, we'll close that poll. So most people have never heard of predatory before. We're just gonna talk really briefly about what it is. Um, and so we've talked about sort of the scholarly literature and scholarly journals, and these are places where, you know, academic, um, primarily academics want to write authoritative information. Predatory journals are ones that are created uh, that look like academic journals, but really aren't. They don't have any of the substance behind them. And they're created for a number of reasons. Sometimes it might just be to make money uh, because people will pay to have their articles 
made freely available. Um, and sometimes they're trying to get certain uh, uh, perspectives across or to get out certain messages. Um, so sometimes they're created for that reason. Um, but often the predatory aspect is about money. So we offer a whole other session about predatory publishing. We've got an, um, a version that we did last fall. It's available on our website because I'm conscious of our time. So we'll, we'll include um, some information about that. But if you are ever looking for resources to assess like this journal seems a little bit off or this seems a little bit funny. Um, there are some specific critical appraisal tools that you can use to look at those journals. So um, we've got, again, we'll send these out to you. There's some, um, some sort of key things that you can look at if you're looking to assess, can I trust this journal or not? Um, and there's one tool here that's got like tons and tons and tons of criteria. But if you're looking for just that initial stage, we still recommend the crap test. It's still a really great perspective because some often will, and if they're, some of these predatory journals are looking better and better and better all the time. Right. Um, but sometimes they still are very easy to spot. So we bring up predatory uh, journals because of the link to Google Scholar. And in Google Scholar, uh, it has everything, right? The good stuff, the predatory stuff, the good stuff, and the not so good stuff. The stuff in the journals that are okay, but maybe the work is not up to par. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so if you're interested, I, like we're just really skimming the surface. And I know for some of you, you know, you don't spend your day in the academic literature and that is totally fine. Um, if you are interested in more, we've got lots of other sessions. Stay tuned for our fall schedule uh, where we talk a lot more about more, uh, more in-depth critical appraisal, more in-depth about predatory more in-depth about searching for health information um, from scholarly sources. So, I guess that we're, we're almost out of time, but that's okay because we're almost out of material. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we just wanted to, want, we wanted to kind of give you an opportunity to type into your, your chat box. Um, if there was anything that you wanted to learn today that we didn't cover, you want to ask some questions, mm -hmm. or if there is anything that, that really kind of resonated with you today, or if you have some really cool tricks that you'd like to use that other people might like to know about. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll give you guys a couple of minutes, and if you want to type away, then please go ahead. Yeah, and again, I'll mention we will send out our slides, and um, what else was I going to mention? Oh, and we will be following up with a little survey about how you found today's session and whether it met your needs or didn't. And uh, yeah, that feedback is always very important. And like Christine mentioned, we'll plug again. Next month, we're doing a session about apps, healthcare, health apps. And more generally. And more generally. Um, we offered a, um, a health app session in February. This one is almost completely new it's pretty yeah we're excited there's lots that we can lot, lots to cover with all the different health apps so if that's of interest to you please make sure you join us for that as well so uh no one oh any way to stop the pop-up ads in your browser setting um you can often uh control those so um, for so it'll depend on like Google will be different or sorry um, Firefox is different than Internet Explorer than um, Chrome. Chrome. Uh, thank you for reading my mind. So uh, you can go into the settings of your of your browser and look for that, or you can Google how do I or like disable apps in pop-ups in. Um, there in are Chrome. also plugins that you can get. Mm -hmm. um, they're they're usually called ad blockers. Um, so just a little personal information about, about me and my household. We don't, we don't have cable. Um, so we, we, uh, we often will watch, uh, shows on, on the network website, right? So they can stream afterwards, like the day after or whatever, but they always have ads and, and that's really annoying. So you can get these ad blockers and when, um, those are active, it'll block ads from coming up. Yeah. Great question. And I 
think that was the only question. Some great feedback. It sounds like everybody enjoyed it today. We thank you so much again for attending. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks. We'll see you next time. We'll stay on for a few minutes, uh, just in case anybody else had some, um, wanted to share. I, I'm enjoying watching as people are sharing their things they learned or their favorite things. Um, but otherwise, uh, we're, that's it for our content. But we're here in case you had some extra questions. And I don't know. Oh, yeah, we're going to Well, we can always 